Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. And I listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Indeed, you are people. My name is Marshall St. Patrick here at one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And we are here. Look at my camera. Here I am. And we are here looking back at day two of the first test between Australia and the West Indies. By now, you should know all the admin things related to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. You can see it on the ticket tape, ticker tape below. You can find us at Carib Cricket on Twitter and Instagram. Like, share, subscribe to this particular video. We're on the road to 4K YouTube subscribers. I looked at the official numbers today. We're on 3,637, I think. So only another 350 odd to get to 4K. And then we can start the road to 5K. But please do, um, please do subscribe uh, to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast before during, after this video, whatever it may be, and tell people who don't know about the quality work we do covering West Indies cricket, male, female, boys, girls, whatever it might be, um, uh, looking at the game in the region. Also, of course, if you'd like to, I should always go through this. Also, of course, if you'd like to, you can support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast uh, financially for as little as $2, two pounds, two rupees, two whatever your currency is. Uh, if you just head to www.patreon.com forward slash carry cricket, every little bit goes a long way in terms of helping us upgrade the quality of what we're doing on this particular channel. Um, you can find all of our videos on the Australia versus West Indies series on the playlist on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to the Australia versus West Indies playlist, you can see all the content that we've released so far with regards to this particular test series. But let's get into it. Let's chop it up. These videos aren't supposed to be longer than 20 minutes. So it's just like a, a quick kind of review of the day's play. Australia resumed day two on 293 for two. If you go back and watch the review video that I did of day one, pretty much what happened on day two is literally everything that I said I thought would happen. Australia batted all the way through to, what, half an hour after T um, on day two. They declared on, I think it was 598 for four. Yep, they declared on 500 and on, sorry, they declared on 598 for four. Um, Labashain, Man Manus Labashain and uh, Steve Smith both hitting double centuries. And 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 to be fair, let's let's call it as we see it, the Australian... Uh, innings they basically went whereas on the first day West Indies were able to restrict them somewhat so Australia's run rate was like 3.2 on date on the second day Australia were going at a fair lick um, if you look at their the double centuries Labashain got his 204 in 350 balls Steve Smith got his 200 not out of 311 balls and then Travis Head who came in after Brathway got Labashain to nick through to De Silva uh, Travis Head fell on 99, but he made his 99 off 95 balls. So all over, all over, all told for the Aussies, they made their 598 for four at a run rate of 3.91, which is a good lick. Of course, those of you watching this will say, no, Mash, a good lick is what England have just done to Pakistan on the road out there where what England have made 500 in a day. But listen, different test matches, different conditions, different... Uh, experiences talking about baseball and talking about England that's for another day um we're focusing on Australia versus West Indies so the Auss the Aussies kind of went about their business well today as you would expect they they got their runs at a good lick and they declared just shy of 600 to basically give themselves 25 overs or just over an hour to to bowl at us on late on the second day but before I get to what uh, Craig and Tej were able to do. Let, let's just talk about the West Indies bowling. Um, I thought, my personal take is that I thought we'd kind, after the first hour, so what I said in the review on day one, I said the first hour is crucial. If we're going to restrict Australia to anything reasonable, 
we'd have to get like one or two wickets in the first hour. And we didn't. And really and truly, I don't even think we actually created any chances in the first hour. So I was awake watching it and it got to about 3.40 a.m., um, maybe even 3.50 a.m. in the UK. And I'd been awake for an hour and a half and I was like, this is dead. Like we ain't going to. It, it was just obvious at that point we're not going to take any wickets. And I was just, I'm in an hour and I was sitting on the couch going, boy, I need to go to bed. I, I went and ate a piece of lemon cake and I was like, should I stay awake? Because we're clearly not going to take any wickets. And people, let me tell you, about 30 minutes before tea, I went to bed. I went to lunch, right? I went to bed, people. I went to bed and I said, dead this game. I'm going to bed because I already know we ain't going to take no wickets for a long, long time on day two. I woke up um, some point after lunch, turned the TV back on. Uh, so it must have been like, what, half four? Or maybe it was like 10 to five or something. So I got a, I got a cheeky one hour sleep in, woke back up, obviously saw that um, Brathwaite got Labashane, um, etc. But the point I'm trying to make is that I didn't. I don't think our bowling was as disciplined. I don't think our bowling was as tight. Um, I don't think it was as penetrative as it was on day one. I thought our body language was a bit defeatist on day two. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, it's hard because the track was like a bat in deck. It was always going to be difficult to prize wickets out. And Craig, I mean... <laughs> Some will say that Craig underbold Mayers. I think Mayers, he was probably thinking, I want to save you because you're actual. You're actually in the top five uh, in terms of batting. So we're going to need you. I don't want to overbowl you, but I, maybe he could have given Mayers a few more overs. Roston Chase bowled the most overs, and that's probably telling. Roston Chase bowled 31 overs, two maidens, none for 140. Economy 4.51. He bowled the most overs of any West Indian bowler probably befitting the fact that he's been picked primarily as a bowler first and not a batter, right? But if you're bowling Roston Chase the most in your bowling attack, that tells me that you've kind of given up the ghost somewhat. And I think that's the best kind of statistical number to use to look at West Indies essentially playing day two, waiting for Australia to declare. I'm not trying to say West Indies gave up. I'm just saying it was basically defensive cricket waiting for the inevitable declaration that's how i felt um love to hear what other people think about that get in the comments below let me know if you saw it that way but the whole day felt a bit flat and it felt like we know australia going to make 550 it's too flat of a deck let's just see how long we can prolong it until they inevitably declare and i think travis head striking at over 199 off 95 probably tells you just how flat it was both in terms of in terms of how we bowled, but also just how flat it was as a deck um, in, in general. Now, the two wickets that did fall, Craig Brathwaite got them. So Craig Brathwaite bowled 12.4 overs, no maidens, two for 65. Now, his economy was 5.13, but here's the thing. We picked a specialist spinner, who, uh, allegedly, which is apparently what Rustin Chase is in the side, yet... Craig Brathwaite out bowled him with his dibbly doublers. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Again, there's question marks to be had about selection and what we were going for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can't have a part-time spinner like Craig Brathwaite out bowl the guy who's actually been picked to spin the ball or bowl the, 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 the spin overs. And particularly if that spinner's not wasn't even holding up an end. In terms of the other bowlers, if we just go through their figures. Kimar Roach, 26 overs, three maidens, none, uh, none for 91, economy 3.5. Jaden Seals, 21 overs, three maidens, one for 95, economy 4.5. Kind of baptism of fire there for Jaden Seals. And I think to be expected, Santolkin and I spoke about this on West Indies on 99.94 DM. I spoke about it in the preview in terms of looking ahead to who was likely to play. I always felt this would be a big test for Jaden. He's never played an overseas test, never played in Australia. So I'm not surprised to see him go, uh, go, go, um, go a high economy because I think he's going to, he's only got two tests, but it's going to take him a while to get into his stride um, as a bowler. Um, and it may be that he only gets one, one bowl in this particular 
first test and then an, only one bowl in again or one chance to bowl again in the second test because of the nature of how good Australia's batting is. Uh, Alzara Joseph, 24 overs, four maidens, none for 83. Economy 3.45. Carl Mayers, 15 overs, two maidens, one for 39. Economy 2.6. Did we under bowl Mayers or was Brathwaite right to protect Mayers given he bats in the top five? Jason Holder, 23 overs, six maidens, none for 70. Economy 3.04. Wasn't as tight as he was on day one, but tight overall in general. So, like I say, the day kind of got away from us. We we looked like we were just waiting for a declaration. But I do think it's worth saying the following. And I tweeted about this. I can't remember when I tweeted it. I can't remember if it was just before T or if it was after T or whatever it was, right? But at some point in um, proceedings, I tweeted, it's no surprise. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. It's no surprise to see the West Indian bowlers struggle here. N- not just because of the nature of the deck. And not even because they're bowling with a kookaburra. But they were bowling to Manus Labashain and Steve Smith. Manus Labashain averages over 54. Steve Smith averages over 60. Not only that, Labashain and Smith were playing at home in conditions they understand inside out. So then I tweeted. So what I tweeted was, how often do our West Indian bowlers, whether in domestic cricket or even in international cricket, get a chance to bowl at two batters who average 54 and 60 and in their own conditions the answer people is basically never okay yeah the 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 one the time to time when we go to india and certain and certain batters but the point i'm trying to make is i'm not surprised they couldn't break the stand between labashain and uh and steve smith because those two are what are they are they top five in the world? Test test batters are those two in the top five? Smith obviously is is Labashain in the top five batters? Test batters in the world probably. Uh, listen, remember our bowlers in domestic cricket bowl at people who average twenty seven, and we consider that okay. <laughs> so so, I just think that you have to put it in context and say, yeah, it w- it would have been good to try and find a way to get Labashain and Smith out, but we also have to look at the reality. You have to look at the reality and say, I don't think many of our bowlers have played at this kind of level and in these conditions before with batters that good. So no surprise to me to see Labashain and Smith go on to hit double centuries. Now, I should just look at the partnership. So Smith and Labashain's partnership was 251 from 398 balls. You can bet your bottom dollar that they're going to be cashing in again at another point in this series. And then Smith and Head, look at this. Steve Smith and Travis Head's partnership was 196 of 208 balls. Say that again, 196 of 208 balls. If if you want, and that's basically a runner ball, 196 run partnership. That's why I'm saying we got licked down in in the mid to latter half of the second day. The Aussies were just having it their own way um, and we were looking flat. So I, I think it's fair to say, or I think my analysis is fair there to say that I think our bowlers were just bowling to get to the declaration. So the declaration came after T. Oh, sorry. Did I talk about Brathwaite's wickets? No, yeah, done that. So the declaration came after T. Um, and we had about an hour and a half to survive the day. And first things first, ultimate props to Tay Shanapal on debut and obviously Craig Brathwaite. We already done know what Craig Brathwaite can do, right? But Shanapal and Brathwaite ended the day on beat in a 74-run partnership off 152 balls. The 152 balls is more important to me. The whole thing we said, and we at Caribbean Cricket Podcast, I, I, re, I found the tweets. We tweeted in January 2020. That's nearly three years ago, people. We tweeted, Tej Narayan Shanapal should be in the West Indies test squad. So we're not we're we're not like a media house or a or media people who are suddenly buying into this Johnny Come Lately narrative. Oh, Tay Shanapal, he's Shiv's son. Oh, what what a narrative. Oh, he's coming of age. No, no, nonsense. Because true students of the domestic game knew Tej was capable of this from time ago. Time. Go look at Tej's domestic stats. I've been I've been talking about this for years, you know, years. Go look at Tej's domestic stats. The guy has averaged over 30 in one, two, just reminding myself, one, two, three, four, 
five of the six domestic seasons he's played, he's averaged over 30. Okay. One of the, uh, obviously this last past season was his complete stellar season, which is probably why he's got the court on top of John Campbell's drug ban as well. Right. But this was long overdue for Tej because in a region where we don't have many top class batters at all in any position, but more importantly, in a region where we don't have many openers who can really, really put up runs and suggest that they should. I mean, John Campbell got in, right? John Campbell got back in after getting dropped. And that talk tells you about the lack of options in the region when it comes to opening. But Tay should have got his chance when John Campbell got his drop. Tay was already knocking on the door. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't buy into this kind of romantic fairy tale narrative that people are spreading about. Oh, it's the Shandapur name and Tasia's come of age. No, Tay should have got his chance a long time ago. And when we, and when I say we, I mean West India's selectors dropped the ball. Now, would Tay have been as comfortable as he was today if he'd got a call earlier? Possibly not. But I guess the point that I'm making is the talent identification should have highlighted Tej at a much earlier stage. It it can't be that I can find a tweet that I that I wrote three years ago where I'm clearly identifying Tej's talent. You know what? Let me run the tweet. Let me run the tweet, you know, because some of you watching this will be like, don't don't gas yourself up. You never said that. Um let me just run the tweet for people so people can see that um I'm not I'm not gassing, right? Let me find this people one second. Uh how do I share my screen again? Here we go. So let me, let me where's the window? Corner man. All right, here we go. Right. So you should see this tweet here on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast handle. So if I just scroll there, look at the date here, people. January 16, 2020. And I tweeted this. It, it was during the so it's just before the pandemic. And it was during the first class season. I said, How long before Tej Narayan Shandapur plays test cricket for the West Indies? There can't be many better first-class openers than him waiting in the wings. His scoring rate is appalling, but that's irrelevant. He clearly puts a value on his wicket, right? And I retweeted that today to remind people, listen, man was calling for Shander Paul from time ago. And that's not to say, oh, Mash, wow, wow, you... That's not That's not the point I'm trying to make. Um, Because I'm more telling you to say, what goes on with talent identification then in the Caribbean? If I could talent identify, who who was responsible for talent identification? What were they waiting for? What were they waiting for from Tej to call him up quicker for A-team cricket or carry him in a test squad on tour somewhere? What were they waiting for? Because you done know none of the other openers were showing anything that made that justified them getting the long runs that they were getting. But anyways, Tej is here now and we wish him well, right? So second day, uh, Tej got to 47 off 73 balls. He got licked down in his in his private parts, um, recovered from that, got peppered with a, some short balls, um, survived an LBW shout, which was not out on umpire's call. But the point is, what Tej showed was he showed grit and he showed heart. He showed a, a desire to, 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 to fight it out. And a few good shots in between, obviously, uh, the hook shot, um, was it over fine leg? can't remember the was it cow corner or whatever it was but anyways a hook shot um off Cummins for six shows his array of strokes as well um so he battled back he 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 um he fought fire with fire so to speak and he he ended the day on not out on 47 now the hope is that going ahead to day three that of course Tej can get his maiden uh half century even better if he could get a maiden century on debut all the better but the point is the foundation is there a solid foundation has has been laid by the opening batters and taking us to 74 without loss at the close of play of 25 overs. At the other end, Craig just did what Craig does. Craig has become so reliable. Craig loves these situations. 18 not out of 79 balls. Craig's already dropping anchor like he wants to score. Like if he gets to a century, I'm not saying he will, but if Craig gets to a century, I'm telling you now that that century is going to come off 365 balls. That's the type of mood that Craig is in. He ain't into stroke play. He's into just grit and try bat through the innings and let everybody else bat around him. But but that is Craig Brathwaite. This team 
this test team is actually built in the in the mold of Craig Brathwaite. If we're going to lose, we lose, but we don't lose without everybody going digging in and trying to fight it out. And I, I love to see it. I absolutely love to see it. And we have to, again, give props to Phil. Because how many of you, when the team came out to bat, uh, at the latter part of day two thought, here we go, three wickets down by by Stumps. We're going to get run over by the Aussie Quicks. And we may still do on day three, by the way. I'm not trying to say that it won't come, but how many of you thought we'd already be blown away um, by Stumps on day two? So full credit to the side, full credit for also the two openers forcing the Aussie commentators and probably some Aussie fans and probably some of our own fans to be like, oh, oh, we're here to fight. We're here to battle. But if you've been studying our test team for the last two years, you shouldn't be surprised. This is this is the one format of cricket in the last two years where you know we're going to try a little piece. We're going to try a little ting. We're not rolling over like some end waste guys. Obviously, South Africa did that to us in the midst of the pandemic when their quicks just smashed us to pieces. But other than that series, actually, I think we've battled. I think we've always shown heart, whether we've won, drawn, or, or lost test matches. So good to see the fight. Um, Before I just quickly look ahead to day three, I just want to say one more thing, though, with regards to Tej. And it's something that I've noticed probably in forums and Twitter and like, and I speak, this is more so for the West Indian fans and those of Caribbean extract. Can we stop the island bias thing, right? And let me explain what I mean by that. I'm here waxing lyrical about what Craig and Tej did to survive the day and dig in and show heart and fight and make us proud. I'm a Jamaican. You think I care that Tej Shandapal is from Guyana? You think I care that Craig Brathwaite is from Barbados? All I care is that they fought for the Maroon and they, they showed that as a West Indies team, we're here to fight at least and we're here to try battle. Can we stop the... So that's me. That's me, yeah? That's me. That's all I care about. Can the people who only want to uplift their countrymen and purely focus on, oh, that's my countryman. Let me talk about how good my countryman is. Allow it. This ain't your, this ain't your nation playing. This is West Indies. This is a collective playing, representing us all. So the same way how I'm proud of Tej's innings today, I don't care that he's done it as a Guyanese. I'm proud of what he's done for the West Indies and what he's done for the Maroon. Can we focus on that first piece, people? Yes, I know some of you have your national pride, but he's not out there playing for Guyana. Craig isn't out there playing for Barbados. They're out there playing for the West Indies. So allow, allow all the national sentiment. Allow all that. I know some of you can't help it, but let's focus on the greater good here. Sometimes that stuff just... Is a bugbear for me. Why, why must we always do up the national stuff first? Let's focus on our actual team. And our team is the West Indies um, in this context. So I just want to try to just get that out. But like I say, anyways, uh, before I wrap this up, looking ahead to day three, what can we expect? I think Aussies are going to fight back. I think the pitch is still good to bat on. Um, I think day four and day five is when it will become a bit more tricky to bat on, possibly. I think we've still got a good track to bat on. Here's what I need West Indies to try and do. So, Aussie's made five, nine, eight. What's the follow-on? Is follow-on 200 runs behind? The first task is of... Well, no, we've got... The first task for day three is survive the day. That's the first task, okay? The second task is get as close to avoiding the follow-on as possible. And that's not me being defeatist. That's me indicating that the follow one is a huge target to reach. Forget, forget talking about can West Indies draw this test match. We're not even there yet. We're not, that can't even come into the equation yet. The equation for day three is simple. Soak up balls, get to the end of the day and get as close to the follow one target as we possibly can. I don't want to hear no other chat, no other chat for day three other than that. Soak up balls, bat out the day and get as close to the follow on target as we can. And then when I drop this video review in day three, um, tomorrow, we'll assess what we can do for day four. So no chat about what result is possible and this, that and the other. Let's just keep, go session by session, soak it all up. Remember, Nkrumah Bonner's in next. I know he suffers against high pace. Um, but so it'll be Bonner, Blackwood, Mayers, Holder, De Silva, Chase. All of them have got test match centuries. 
all of them. So there is no excuse for them to not apply themselves, soak up balls, reach the end of the day, get as close to the follow-on as possible, and then assess what we do in day four, session by session by session. If you need to, break it down in sections of 10 overs by 10 overs. Soak it up, soak it up, soak it up, and make the Aussies work. My name is Marshall St. Patrick here at One Half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. That's been my day two review. Join me again tomorrow when I review day three and enjoy uh, day three, which should be starting in approximately, what, eight hours? I've got to release this one earlier. Nice little run-in for the start of day three. So whenever you watch this, sometime within the next uh, within the next eight hours, you should be sitting down to enjoy day three of the first test match. So uh, find us on Twitter. We'll be there chatting through the, the, the test match and whatnot. But until the day three review, people, I'll see you soon. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.